Welcome, students, to our Chapter 2, Part 2 video lecture from our two-semester general chemistry series. This lecture will continue our cerebral hemorrhaging discussion on atoms, molecules, and ions. Many years ago, when I was working as a newly hired 15-year-old busboy at a small Italian restaurant in my hometown, my supervisor told me to clear all of the silverware, plates, drinks, and food from one of the tables near the back of our dining hall. But there are still people eating there, I exclaimed. They're done, he said. Just go and clear their table. Okay, I replied hesitantly, and I shuffled off to do as I was told. As mentioned, these people were still sitting at the table as I cleared it. In typical busboy fashion, I put one of my fingers in one of their drinks so that I could carry up to five glasses in one hand at a time. As I did so, one of the guests sitting at the table exclaimed, You're putting your fingers in my drink! <laughs> Now, he had a tone that to me at the time sort of sounded like he was just being sarcastic, and I thought he was just engaging in humorous banter. And besides, my supervisor had unequivocally told me that they were done and that this table needed to be cleared. Now, keeping in mind that I really thought this guy was just trying to engage in healthy and humorous banter with me, I replied cheerfully to him by saying, Sir, here at our restaurant, we are happy to place any of our appendages in any of your beverages at any time. I then threw the drinks on my bus cart and left, taking these people's food and beverages back to the kitchen to be washed. <laughs> um, I was soon informed by my supervisor's superior that these people were indeed not yet finished with their drinks. Unsurprisingly, I had to give them new ones. <laughs> So just as I grow in my abilities as a teenage busboy with practice, so shall you grow in your skills as a young chemist if you give all due diligence to your studies. With that thought in mind, by the end of this lecture, you guys should be able to determine the number of electrons in an atom based on its charge, predict the charge of an element's most stable ion, explain what electronegativity is, and be familiar with electronegativity trends on the periodic table, and know the difference between ionic, covalent, and metallic bonds. But before I begin, I want to start first by sharing with you a humorous chemistry cat of the day from quickmeme.com. You should get this now that we've learned about neutrons, protons, and electrons from our previous lecture. Here it is. Neutron wants to pay a tab. The bartender says, for you, no charge. <laughs> all right, so let's begin with today's pile of topics. First of all, sometimes we're asked to determine how many electrons a specific atom has. We can do that by solving the following formula. An atom's number of electrons equals its number of protons minus its charge. This brings us to one great problem from our problem set. There are blank protons, blank neutrons, and blank electrons in iodide-135. Now you'll notice by looking at this molecule, this is an I minus. That means that it has a charge of negative 1. Now keeping in mind that the number of protons in iodine is always equal to its atomic number, this iodine is of course going to have 53 protons, because 53 happens to be iodine's atomic number. Now. Given the fact that it has a charge of negative 1 and its number of protons is equal to 53, you ask yourself, how many electrons does it have? Well, we can use this equation. An atom's number of electrons equals its number of protons minus its charge. So if I take the number of protons, 53, and I minus a negative 1 from it, that's the same thing as taking 53 plus 1. So its number of electrons equals 54. Now, this hopefully will help solve some mysteries. You see, electrons have a negative one charge per electron, and protons have a positive one charge per proton. Thus, it makes sense that if you have an ion that is a charged atom that has a negative charge, it must have more electrons than it has protons. Conversely, if you have an atom that has a positive charge, it must have more protons than it has electrons. And here are some more problems that I think you can solve for your own. Which species has 54 electrons? And next, an ion, that is a charged atom, has eight protons, nine neutrons, and 10 electrons. The symbol for this ion is what? Now remember, of course, you can match that by looking at the number of protons. The number of protons will always, always, always equal that element's atomic number. I now wish to teach you about valence electrons. And what are valence electrons? <laughs> well. All elements, just so you know, have a certain number of total electrons, which is equal to their number of protons minus their charge. However, atoms' electrons are separated into two different types. 
their valence electrons and their core electrons. Valence electrons are the electrons found in the outermost layer of the element. If an element were an apple, then its valence electrons would be located on the apple's skin. Any other electrons in an atom which are located deeper down are called core electrons. Let's examine this more closely by looking at the periodic table. Take, for example, the element lithium shown right here, which is located in group 1A. How many total electrons does a neutral lithium atom have? Well, it has three, the same number as it has protons. But how many valence electrons does it have? Well, it only has one, and the reason is because it's in column 1A. Hence, of its three electrons, only one of its electrons is a valence electron, and the other two are core electrons. Similarly, beryllium has two valence electrons, boron has three valence electrons, carbon has four, nitrogen has five, oxygen has six, and fluorine has seven. Why? Because these elements are in groups 2a, 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, and 7a, respectively. Hence, the column number in which an element is found on the periodic table corresponds to its number of valence electrons, if the atom is uncharged. Now, what about elements in lower rows? Same thing. Every single element in column 7a, for example, has seven valence electrons, spanning all the way down from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine to astatine. In analogous fashion, every single element in column 6a has six valence electrons, every one in 5a has five valence electrons, and so forth. Now, what about the elements in the D block? Well, for those elements, things are a little bit more complicated. I'm going to ignore them right now and just tell you this. For atoms in columns 1a through 8a, the column number is the same as that atom's number of valence electrons if you have a neutral, uncharged atom.